Good morning. Let's go ahead and let's stand and sing while everybody else comes traveling in. We have done great things. This song is called Great Things. The Lord has done great things. It goes, come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. Do you believe that this morning? Let's stand and sing this morning. Let's give God some glory and some praise and lift Him up. And let's magnify His name for He is worthy. Amen.
gave us his one and only son to save for God's the Lord a hand this morning for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life yes that is the KJV version I can give you the other ones but I can't remember them I just learned them all in that in that version but so thankful for God's word I'm thankful for his truth I'm thankful for what he means to us as a body of Christ. And Hunter, use your ADD and slow it down a little bit. Stop playing the drums while I'm talking. <laughs> Y'all have a seat for just a minute. We're going to do something very special. Today is Mother's Day. And so here's what we're going to do. I would like for all the moms, if you're a mom in this facility as we speak right now, I would you like for you to come up to the front and I want to present a flower to you and thank you uh, on behalf of our church uh, and have a word of prayer for you. So moms, it's not an option. You got to come. So come on up here and uh, stand right up here and I want to have a word of prayer with you. I want to just give you this. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. And uh, Miss Krista in the nursery, if she would come on back. Thank you so much. She's right there. She'll be all right. <laughs> Amen. Let's come on there. Moms, that's right. Give them a hand. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's come on. Hey, Miss Krista, come on. So this is, I got plenty. So I want you to have that right there. Thank you so much, mamas. And that's there we go. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us this morning. God bless you. God bless you. Hey, how are you? Thank you for being here. Hey, Miss Terry. There you are. Thank you very much. God bless you, Miss Dawn. Thank you, Miss Heather, our newest mom, right? Hey, there you go. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miss Genesis. Praise the Lord. Thank you for coming up here. All right, look here. If it weren't for these women right here, we wouldn't be here. If it weren't for mamas, we would, uh, we would not be here. And I'm so thankful for each and every one of you. And I want to just say a word of encouragement. I do this every year. Uh, and make it a, a point to recognize our mothers because the Lord knew what he was doing when he gave us a mama. He knew what he was doing when he put what he put in the, the, the essence of of what he put in you to raise, to lead, to guide, to help. You are a representation of the Holy Spirit in the home. And God has used you to, to mold. He has used you to encourage. He has used you to fashion uh, the next generation. And so I know there's tears that dwell up in your eyes. There's tears that dwell up in your heart. Uh, but God is using you even now. Look at me, every one of you. God is using you even today through the raising of your children, through helping your children now raise children, through the prayers of mama. I mean to tell you, there ain't nothing like when I was a little boy, I would open up and I would hear some mumbling going on. And I would hear murmuring, and I would hear weeping, and I would put my ear to the door, and it was my mama by her bed on her knees praying for me. And that changed everything, because there's still power in prayer. And God using you, and God helping you to get us 
to where sometimes if it means Scott, Matthew, Salibi, when you hear the whole name, you know you're in trouble. Go get me a switch off of that tree. Now, they don't do that no more these days. They, they just, you know, but it don't matter. When you in trouble with mama and mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. You better remember that, right? So, praise the Lord for mamas. Let's give the Lord a hand for our mothers this morning. Thank you so much for being here this morning. You are honored. The Lord is thankful for you for what you are doing, how you are continuing to do that. And it does not matter in what fashion or what form motherhood has come to you. Listen to me. It does not matter how you became a mama. It does not matter to what extent you are a mother. But God chose you for a purpose. And uh, my wife who is not here today is, is a mother four times over. But there's one that is not with us. He is in heaven with Jesus. And that might be the case that you might be thinking this morning of one that, that the Lord gave you for a short, a short season, but has taken him to be reunited with you again. Why? Because we have a hope in Jesus Christ. A hope that is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So you celebrate Mother's Day, do you celebrate Father's Day next month? And we're going to give God glory, even though sometimes we don't understand His ways, we're going to fashion and trust in His way, knowing that it is just and true and right, and that He makes no mistakes. Heavenly Father, this morning, thank you for our mothers this morning. We thank you, Lord, for what they have done for not just this community, not for just our homes, but Lord, what you have done through mothers to, to help make America, help make families. Lord, the breakdown of the home has a lot to do with the mom and the dad. And God, there is important and vital a role that they play in the well-being of not just our country, but our home. And Lord, we're so thankful this morning for our mothers. We lift them up to you this morning, and we give you praise, and we give you glory this morning as each one of these special ladies this morning who, who are moms, who are mothers. And God, we, we lift them up to you this morning as a sweet aroma as a sacrifice of offering, of praise to you for how you have fashioned them and you are continuing to grow them in whatever season of motherhood they are in. And God, we ask and pray that you would put a hedge of protection around each one of them and help them as they continue in truth and wisdom in the, in the right spirit, Lord, to continue to raise and to help raise and to be the mothers that we need today. As Christ is the center of their life. Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you for our mothers. And we give you all the glory and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give them a hand this morning. Thank you so much. You can have a seat. God bless you so much. You are very special to us. Amen. I tell you what, let's do that song one more time. God so love. And let's stand back to our feet and let's do that and we'll do our announcements after that song. But let's, let's worship just a few more minutes this morning with this song, God So Loved. Amen.
waiting. God so loved the world. Man, you can have a seat. Let's watch this announcement video. What's happening in the next little bit? We're so happy that you could join us today. If you are a first time guest, will you please meet at the end of the service with the pastor in the back? We would love to meet you and we also have a small gift talk for you. If you're joining us online, please be sure to like or subscribe and click on the connection card and tell us a little bit about yourself. If you have a prayer request, we would love to hear from you. The most beautiful woman in the world is the one who is fearlessly herself, standing in who her Creator made her to be, and the one who runs relentlessly after God's own heart. She is one who faces giants with the faith of David, casting stones for the glory of the Lord, and walking in the true victory that can only come from such courage. She's one who wears the armor of God, not as an accessory, but as a necessity, and she pursues spiritual growth with such tenacity. She embraces the seasons of life, and she sees the beauty in God's sovereignty. She fights for and unearths her spiritual identity, and she walks in her kingdom destiny. If this is the kind of woman that you want to become, join me in the Ayla Project. Here at New Covenant Church, we believe that God has blessed us with so many spiritual gifts. Uh, what we do need from you all is somebody to volunteer, or some people to volunteer, uh, to help out in the kids' ministry. Um, you don't have to have any experience or just need to have that love to want to plant and sow into the young people of Christ. June 11th, Unveiled Youth Group will be going to Carowinds. We would love to have you. We believe that giving is an act of worship. There are several ways you can give today. Through the Tithely app, by mail. You can drop it in the basket on your way out or through our website. And repentance and rest is our salvation, and quietness and trust is your strength. To all the mothers out there today, thank you so much for caring for us and loving us. Happy Mother's Day. One more time. All right. Look, I don't know what's going on, but y'all are deader than dead. So I don't know what it is, but uh, let's stand to our feet. And let's worship the Lord this morning. And let's do it with an intentional purpose. Amen. Uh, when you come into the house of God. We're going to talk about this today. You bring in the spirit of God. There's a reason why. And I don't want to get into my sermon. Because I don't want to spoil it all. There's a reason why. That God said. I don't want you to carry the Ark of the Covenant. On an ox cart. You can't. You can't. You can't bring in the Spirit of God, the presence of God, just any old way. It had to be carried in on, I'll tell you in the sermon, on the shoulders of His people. So we'll talk about that here in a minute. How great is our God? Y'all believe that this morning? Do you really believe that this morning? Well, let's worship the Lord and give Him glory and magnify His name. And I'm going to pass out a few more flowers to some moms who just came in. Y'all, let's worship. How great is our God.
is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Let's sing that chorus one more time. Let's have our young people step out to the C4 class. Teacher, wait for you at the door. How great is our God. Praise the Lord. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. You can have a seat this morning. Thank you Micah, Hunter, Fred Matt let's continue to pray for CJ uh beans but they're expecting another child <laughs> I've been yes give the Lord a hand amen amen thank you Hunter thank you Micah Fred Pastor Fred you like that don't you <laughs> it's a reminder of his redemption isn't it amen Fred and Marlene I knew them when I was a teenager running around being a moron in Myrtle Beach. They knew me before I was a preacher. And I remember watching him come to church and Marlene come to church and Annie and and, and Curtis and, and they would come in and he would show up for everything. I mean, and he was wearing his... I always remember you with that mailman outfit with the shorts and your stories of getting dog attacked and all that. So... Uh, it's an honor and blessing to see them this morning and to be able to look out and to see God working in lives. Listen, had it not been for Him, we would all be most miserable. Had it not been for the salvation that was brought to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And uh, this morning, there's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of things that, that we bring in that can remind us of of our past there's things that we can bring in that can remind us of of the uh of the struggles the the infirmities the 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 transgressions of our past there's a lot of things that we could be reminded of but had it not been for Jesus he's the reason why we're here this church honors and magnifies he is the centerpiece of conversation is about Jesus now you you might have not ever come to a church before and just so you know that that is not the case across America Jesus is not the centerpiece of the congregation he's not the centerpiece of the sermon he's not the centerpiece of the week it's agendas and programs and 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 I don't know just all kinds of things and we're living in a generation today when we have churches across America who are not preaching the gospel it's a different gospel they call it a progressive gospel meaning it it can get better and the gospel can't get better the power of the gospel is the same yesterday today and forever. It is under the lordship and the character of Christ Jesus, who is in Hebrews the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I thank God for his word, and I'm thankful that we have a, a church body that, that believes that. And uh, so here we are, 
Week 18. I, I don't look, honestly, I thought it was only going to last like 10, 12 weeks. But the Lord has had a different uh, plan. And so when He tells you to do something, you need to do it, or else things are not going to be good. Uh, so here we are, week 18. And last week, we, uh, we talked about the Ark of the Covenant just briefly. Now, I'm going to bring it back out here, and we're going to get in depth to this. Now remember when we talk about Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 10, it was giving us a shadow. The tabernacle was a shadow, a type of the real tabernacle that is in heaven. And so we looking at each one of these things. Now I'm not going to have time. I'll be here for three years talking about the tabernacle. And I'll lose about 80% of you. Uh, there's only so much you can talk about furniture. But we're going we're gonna to make it compact like a stick of dynamite. How about that? And so we're every single piece of furniture in this tabernacle that was in the Old Testament is a picture of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to show that to you in the, uh, in the way of this, this model. Uh, give me, come here Adam, give you do me a favor. Just, I want you to, I want you to grab the table right here, right here, right here, right here. And we're going to walk this way and we're going to put this in the front and, and we're going to, let's not, don't tip it now because I don't, and don't touch it. I don't want the glory of God to blow us to smithereens. <laughs> You weren't allowed to touch the Ark of the Covenant. You weren't allowed to get near the presence of God. Uh, matter of fact, right there, thank you, Adam. Matter of fact, when Moses was called up on the mountain, God stopped the conversation and said, Get back down to the mountain and tell them not to get any closer, lest my glory kills them. And so I had a buddy of mine who's made this, and this is a small replica of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I want you to take a good look at this because we're going to get into all of the pieces of this ark today. We're going to look at what this truly is. We don't talk about it. You don't hear about it much. Although you've seen it on the movies and Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark and, and all of these crazy theories of what it is and what its purpose was. But we know... Uh, that God used this piece of furniture. Now last week we talked about the three different sections of the tabernacle. We talked about the outer court. We talked about, uh, let's see, let's get to it. We talked about the outer court. This outer court here was where they would take the sacrificial lamb or the ox and they would come through and they would, they would sacrifice the animal here in the outer court. And this square here represents the brazen altar of sacrifice. And they would take that animal, that innocent lamb, and they would kill it. And its blood would spill onto the coals of this burning sacrifice. And so we see this outer court. This is where all of us dwelt as a child of God. We dwelt here. And most every child of God stays here in the outer court. And we talked about that. And that's the first section. And then you go into the holy place here. This holy place has three pieces of furniture. There's the, to the left is the lampstand. And it was filled with oil. It was a seven-tier menorah. And it's filled with oil twice a day. Oil that's brought from the crushed olive from the children of Israel every single day. And it stayed lit continuously. It is the only light that is in the tabernacle in the holy place. The only light that you see, that you can see that over here on the right was the table of showbread. It was a picture of God's communion with man. The very bread, there were 12 loaves, 12 tribes, one for each tribe of Israel. And so this bread would be on the table and you could not eat it until it was offered to the Lord first. 
And then at the end of the week, they would bake fresh bread and the priest who were working in the tabernacle would eat that bread. And so then right in front of this third section was a veil. This veil was about four to six inches thick. And it was separating the holy place from the holy of holies. And this veil, there was an altar of incense. Now next week we're going to look at the altar of incense. We're going to talk about the three types of smoke that were represented in the tabernacle. And we're going to look at there was smoke that came from the altar of sacrifice. Smoke that came from the altar of incense which was a picture of the prayers of his saints. And then there was a smoke that came from the holy of holies. And in that back section, that third section, we find the Ark of the Covenant. Now that's a pretty cool replica isn't it isn't it pretty cool y'all like that I didn't make it but it's pretty cool and my buddy Justin made it now this beautiful replica represents the ark of the covenant and the bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 4 it said having a golden altar of incense that we're going to talk about next week and the ark of the covenant this is the item we're going to discuss today and how it represents Jesus and how it is applicable to us today. And the Bible says it was covered on all sides with pure gold. Now it was made out of acacia wood. A little dusty. Might have to have that clean for next week. But it was made out of acacia wood. This acacia wood came from the Shedem tree. And it was actually this particular wood. Uh, uh, tree was used for medicinal purposes. It was helped in uh, with sores and cuts and different things like that. And this acacia tree was a very indestructible wood. This acacia wood, very and it was impervious to rot, to bugs, to termites. Couldn't get to this wood. It was a special uh, blended type of wood, and God used this particular wood. To carve out, he had Bezalel and Aholiab, those two men I talked about last week, and they, they carved out this. And the Bible says that it was made out of acacia wood and covered in pure gold. The staves that go through that, we'll talk about here in a minute. Now, this is not gold, but pretend there's gold on it. Gold, alright? Acacia wood covered in pure gold, and it was used as a pole to carry the Ark of the Covenant. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, let's continue to read. It says, And in which was inside of this particular piece of furniture was three items. Now, we have this Ark of the Covenant. Here's a picture of it on the screen. Now, the Bible talks about three different arks. And we got to understand these three so we can understand the main one that God used for the presence to rest uh, on the Ark of the Covenant. The Bible talks about this, and I mentioned it briefly last week. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 14, the Bible says that he told Noah, Make me an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and you will pitch it within and without with pitch. And so we have this, this ark. You look at it on, you know, you got pictures of it. You can see it. There was this gigantic ark. It was like 81, some 85 feet long, 50 feet wide. It was this massive thing. And they, they took two of every kind. They did the whole bit. And so the Bible says that this particular word ark in Genesis 6 means tabah, means a box. And this box was a preservative. It was used to preserve what was inside the box. Now it's important that we understand that because simply God designed it. Noah built it. It was a divine collaboration between God and man. And when God designs something and man obeys it, God gives the plan, man obeys the plan, God saves man through the plan. Amen? So we got to understand that. So this tabah, this box was used to preserve what was inside. Then on the second time you see the word ark is in Exodus chapter 2 when Moses is 
being hunted down like every male child was with the sword to be killed. And Moses' mother made an ark of bulrushes or, or some sort of an ark that she pitched. The Bible says she pitched it within and without. An ark of bulrushes. And when she could no longer hide him, she took this baby Moses and placed him in this ark, which means tabah or a box. Now follow me here. And the Bible says that she daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the baby Moses inside this box, this ark. And she laid it in the flags or in the, the uh, what do you call the cat cattails you see out in the river. And she laid it in the river's brink. This was in the Nile River, according to the geographical location of Exodus chapter 2. The Nile River. When I think of the Nile River, what gigantic reptile do you think of a crocodile this thing had crocodiles in it now the baby was just a baby Moses was just a child he did not know anything about anything he did not realize oh my mom's put me in this weird box and I'm in the river he was just a child all he could do was understand that putting his trust in his mother, putting his trust in, in the, the whole purpose of, of mom is my protector. Mom is my, he's just resting in the love of his mother. But mama had no choice and mama had to put her son in a box to preserve him. And get him to a place where he was safe. Now it was on the strength of the ark. Moses was safe. Moses was laid in the ark that his mother made to preserve him from danger. It does not matter what you go through. It matters what you travel in. How can you make that personal? You're going through a circumstance in your life. You're going through a situation in your life. And you don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to you. It doesn't make sense to me. It's gritty. It's gruesome. It's tough. You're going to get battle scars. You're going to get cut. You're going to bleed. You're going to cry. You're going to weep. You're going to have nights of sleeplessness. But all the while, in the midst of your condition, it is not about your condition of which you are in. It is your position. You're inside the protected hands of Jesus. This ark was protecting what was inside. It was preserving what was inside this ark. There's a lot of us that need to understand it is not in our circumstances by which we trust in our day to go good. You wake up in the morning tomorrow and your alarm clock might not go off. And you get in your car. No, even worse. You go to the coffee pot and it breaks on you. Oh, Lord Jesus. And now you got to figure out how to get to the gas station to get one of them jacked up house brews. And then the coffee bean tastes like somebody rang it through a dirty sock. And you crank your car and it doesn't start. Now swear words are beginning to form up in your spirit. It does not matter... What's happening around you, it is all in who is preserving you, who is living inside of you that makes a difference. Now, we have the ark that preserves. Now, this is the third and only time you'll see the word ark mentioned. Three times, but two different meanings. This ark of the covenant had a different meaning. And when you find out what it means, it's going to start to make some sense. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 50, this is the last time you see this word. Joseph is at the end of his life. He lived to be 110 years old. Bro was old. And the Bible says they embalmed him. Why did they embalm him? That was a Pharaoh type thing. Well, you got to remember where he was raised, he grew up, they embalmed him. And the Bible says they put him in a coffin. This word coffin, also the same word that we get in our Hebrew, the Ark of the Covenant. Around, all round, a 
A-W-R-O-N-E, around. Means a box, an ark, a coffin, or better yet, a mummy case. And now, last week I mentioned this briefly about this mummy case. God used a mummy case. He used a coffin. Listen. He used a coffin to serve as his earthly throne. This is where God rested. He used it. Why did he use a coffin, a picture of death, to be his earthly throne? Because... Had it not been for the plan of death, there would have been no plan of salvation. Something had to die in order for something else to live. And so we look in Exodus chapter 25. The Bible says in verse 10, They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length. And a cubit, if you, were, if you want to know, is about from your elbow to the tip of your middle finger. That's about a cubit. A little more than a foot. And so the Bible says it was two cubits and a half uh, in its length. And a cubit and a half in its breadth. And a cubit and a half in its height. You shall overlay it with pure what? Gold. Remember what the word gold in scripture is a type of. It's a type of his deity. It's a type of his supreme authority. And so we have gold. Overlaid in pure gold. And inside, underneath the element of gold, is the acacia wood. The wood, remember, is a picture of Jesus. His humanity. So we have gold. We have wood. And the Bible says it was pitched within and without with gold. There was gold inside it as well. Gold, wood, gold. Gold, God the Father, Go, wood, God the Son, Jesus Christ, all man, all God. And then gold on the outside, God the Holy Spirit. Gold, wood, gold, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, you shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and outside shall you overlay it. And then notice, there was a, a it was surrounded with a ridge, a crown on the edge so that the blood would stay on the mercy seat. So this is the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. This is the mercy seat that the blood was laid on when the priest would take the blood from the sacrificial brazen altar. And that blood was poured out on the mercy seat, the lid. This is the coffin. This is the lid. But the Bible goes on to say that there was more to this particular element. Now, here's another picture of it. Gold, wood, and gold. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, we've already read this, but I'll read it again. This was, mo this was months ago when I, when I did this chapter 4. The Bible says... Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Right? Jesus Christ passed through the heavens. Jesus said, let us hold fast our confession. Remember? Remember the Hebrew people, the, the, the church? Remember the, the author was, at a time he wrote Hebrews. Remember now? We don't know who the author was. Could have been him, could have been her, we don't know. But it was written to the body of Christ, to the church. And the Bible says that it was to Christians who, are, who, were, who were discouraged because of the persecution that was going on around them. And so this particular author decides to encourage them with the article that was in the Old Testament. A mummy case, a picture of God's presence resting on death. Mm-hmm. And the Bible says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Meaning Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, knows exactly what you're going through this morning. Amen! Goes right there. Jesus Christ knows exactly how you're feeling in your spirit because he's walked in our shoes. God, gold, 
sent his son Jesus, who was all gold and all wood, the perfect collaboration of God and man, divine collaboration in the son Jesus Christ. And he says, he knows our sympathies, and all, but one who in every respect has been tempted just like we are, yet without sin. Then he says, verse 16, let us then with confidence, not arrogance, not pride, with confidence, he says, let us draw near to the throne of what? Grace. This coffin, in a minute we're going to look how it becomes a throne of grace because of one item. What, right now, the Ark of the Covenant with the lid off is a picture of what? Judgment. What did God say? I got three items I want you to put in this coffin. And uh, these three items need to be hidden from me. Because if, you, if I look and see these three items, it's going to remind me of your sin. And I'm going to destroy you. It's throne of judgment. But it was not until the throne of grace... When he put the lid on the Ark of the Covenant and covered it with what? The blood. It is gold. The blood of Jesus. And so when I see the what? The blood. I will pass. I will pass over you. I found an old hymn that I used to sing when I was a boy. Christ our Redeemer died on the cross Let's see. Died for the sinner, paid all his due. Y'all know that one? Sprinkle your soul with the blood of the Lamb. And I will pass, will pass over you. Remember that? Oh, great compassion, oh, boundless love, oh, loving kindness, faithful and true. Find peace and shelter under the blood. And I will pass, will pass over you. And we all sing, when... When I see the blood, right? When I see the blood, when he sees the blood, he will forget all my sins and transgressions. <laughs> it's the blood. He sees the blood. But when the lid is off, it is no longer a throne of grace. It is a throne of judgment. And this is the whole purpose of why he... Had God, had, Mo, uh, had Moses designed this. Now, all man, all God. All wood, all gold. The Bible says that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 100% man, 100% He was wood enough to be related to us. But gold enough, listen, to redeem us. He was wood enough to be my kinsman redeemer. But gold enough to buy me out of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. He was wood enough to be touched by the feeling of his infirmities. But he was gold enough to change the thing that touched him. Remember the woman touched the hem of his garment? Virtue flowed out. He was wood enough to weep at the tomb of Lazarus, but gold enough to raise him from the dead. He was wood enough to nurse at the breast of Mary, still gold enough to turn water into wine. 100% gold, 100% wood. Now, in Exodus chapter 25, the Bible talks about, verse 12, it says, You shall cast four rings of gold. Four rings of gold. There's a ring here of gold, a ring here, a ring here, and a ring here. Four rings, four corners, four gospels. The gospel goes out to all four corners of the earth. That's what I said earlier. We're, we're America's preaching stuff that ain't the gospel. If it can't be preached everywhere, then it's not the gospel. If, if the gospel is, is not centerpieced on the Lordship of Christ, then it's not the gospel. You don't change the gospel to appease your culture. The culture is going to change, but he never changes. 
So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, all, all four corners in Judea, into Samaria, into Jerusalem, and the other parts of the earth, the uttermost parts, here, near, and far. Four rings, four Gospels. And the Bible says in verse 13, you shall make poles of acacia wood. I'm going to need your help here in just a minute. Anthony, I'm going to need your help. I'm going to need your help. Mike, I'm going to need your help. You and uh, Lane, even with the busted arm, you can do this. Four rings, four gospels. One, two, three, four. Then he said, I want you to take poles out of acacia wood, layer it in pure gold, and I want you to keep, but notice what he says, I want you to put them in the side. You shall put the poles in the rings in the sides of the ark to carry the ark of the covenant. And he goes on to say in verse 15, the poles shall remain in the rings of the ark, not to be removed. You shall put into the ark of the testimony that what I shall give you. Why could these have to always, why did these always have, these did not, they kept these poles in the ark and it did not move until they got it to Solomon's temple. Because until then he said these poles stay where they are because I have not found a place to rest the presence of God. And so what we see here is these poles were a mode of transportation for the Ark of the Covenant. Now, Ryan, I need you to come. Anthony, I need you to come. And, 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 and Micah, and, and uh, just try to get on the side that it's not a busted arm. And I want you to carry this on your shoulder one at a time. You guys turn this way and lift it up together and put it on your shoulder. Now, stop. What does this look like? It, it, yeah, that's a coffin. What do we do at funerals? We have coffins, and what do we do with them on our shoulders? These were pallbearers. This is the same symbol that we see in a funeral of, of today. So this, that you guys are going to get a workout today. All right, so step out from the table together so you don't run it. Anthony doesn't hit the table. Now I want you just to walk two or three steps. All right, all right, stop right there. Now, the Bible says these poles shall remain in the ark. Now, what is the one thing that we see happening here? This is what, where the presence, I'm going to fall one of these days. The presence of God is resting on the ark of the covenant. This is how God would move around when God's Levitical priesthood, when his people would carry the ark with the poles on their shoulders. David tried to do this back in Numbers 13 and it was a complete disaster. The Bible says that David was so excited, this big celebration. And so he's like, I'm going to get a new cart with an ox and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have, have Uzzah carry this cart in on an ox cart. And the Bible says that the ox got a little wobbly and he lost his balance. And the Bible says the ark began to tip out of the box and Uzo reached out to touch it, to, to balance it. And he was struck dead immediately because you can't touch God's holiness and live. God don't play. And it made David mad. So they, David got rid of the ark and sent it to a place called Obed-Edom for three months. And while the ark was there, the whole camp was blessed by God. Everywhere the presence of God went, there was victory, there was excitement, there was provision, because they would take this Ark of the Covenant in Jericho, read the story in Jericho, they would take this Ark ahead of those that were going to... And they would march around the wall of Jericho. But the Ark of the Covenant went before everybody else. The presence of God went before God's people. And the walls fell. They would take this into the battlefield. And before the battle would even begin to start. The people of Israel saw God's presence coming in on the shoulders of his people. And they would shout, "Woo! The battle belongs to the Lord. If you want God to move on your life, you must get around God's people and place God in the center. Now I want you guys to walk. Just walk a couple more steps. 
All right. Now I want you to balance. All right. And I want you to turn. Micah, you and Lane, turn. And I want you to make a. I want you to come about. And I want Micah and Lane. I want you to walk towards Miss Alex over there. Don't get don't get up in her grill. Just walk kind of towards her. All right. God's presence is going. All right. Stop right there. God's presence is going wherever God's people carry Him in. That's why it's important when we come to the house of God that we make sure that we are not a deterrent to the Spirit of God moving on our life because you can come in living like hell all week and not doing what you're supposed to be doing, not being obedient to Him. And you can come in and bring a spirit inside with you that is contrasting to the Spirit of God working in His people. What does it say in Matthew 18, 20? For where two or more, what? Gathered together in whose name? See, that's big key right there. It's got to be in his name, not in Scott the preacher's name, not in the associate pastor's name, not in the youth director's name, not in the name of, of whatever Cooth is in, in church today, not in the name of a program, not in the name of, of a financial uh, prideful thing, but in the name of... Jesus, there I am amongst them. There I am in the midst. Now you guys carefully set that back down. Thank you so much. You guys, I got the two short guys in the front and I got the two tall big guys in the back. There you go, thank you. Now nice and easy now. I don't want you to drop the presence of God. Thank you so much. Perfect, excellent. So if you want God to move in your life, so that you're saying, I don't see God moving in my life. Well, maybe it's because you're not carrying Him in. Maybe you've not invited Him in to where you are. And how do we do that? Through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a, a person that we, we summon up whenever we want something. The Holy Spirit, listen, if you don't believe this, then you probably need to find another church. The Holy Spirit is a person of God who you yield to every single day of your life. You want God to work in your life? You need to obey the Spirit of God who's working in you. How, what do you mean by that? Well, in order to understand that, we've got to take this lid off. And I know it becomes now it's the, the judgment of God. Why? Because the lid's not on it. And yet he can see what's inside it. What was inside it? Well, we're going to look at that for just a minute. The Bible says that there were three items that we find in Exodus 25. He says... I want you to put three things in there. The first thing we see is the law, the Ten Commandments. There were Ten Commandments that were in there. The Ten Commandments were a picture of the law. The law that you and I failed to meet. The law you and I could not fulfill. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. The, the law was a picture. It was, the law was against us. The law brings sin. When there was, there was no law, there was no sin. But when the law came, it exposes sin. Right? And so when God looked at the law, He reminded of our failure. And He would have killed us. But because of the mercy seat that was placed on the lid. And the blood of Jesus was resting on it. He was satisfied. There's a difference between being pacified. That was the pacification of God. This Old Testament. But the satisfaction of God. The pleasing of God and His holiness. Came through His Son Jesus Christ. So we have the law. He completed what we failed to do. He did what I could not do. I am in righteousness. Because of not of a me. Because of Jesus Christ. Who came to fulfill the law. So. Not only that, but we have what? Pot of manna. We have the law. Jesus did not come to destroy, but to fulfill it. But then we have this pot of manna. Now, I was explaining earlier uh, to Ryan and Alex's children. They were asking me about the picture. And I, and I was showing them this pot of manna. The Bible talks about this in Exodus 16. Let me, let me uh, if you have your Bible, just, I know I don't ask you to turn, but if you have your Bible, just look at Exodus 16 for just a second. And I want to read just a quick verse or two about this pot of manna. This, this was the second item. Now we've got the fulfillment of the law in Christ Jesus. That's the Ten Commandments. That points to Christ. Now we have 
this pot of manna. The Bible says in Exodus 16, this was the children of Israel were, were grumpy and complaining and mad at Moses because they, they were taken out of slavery in Egypt but were getting fed and getting water all the time and their bellies were full. But now they're free in the wilderness and they're mad at Moses and Aaron because they said, you took us out here to die. And the Bible says that God told Moses to tell the people. He said this. He said, let me get my reading glass. Because boy, I tell you what. I'm almost 50. It starts to get to you. The whole congregation, verse 2, of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses. Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat. When we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill all of us with hunger. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, look what it says. I will rain bread from heaven for you. So here we have Moses goes and tells the children of Israel, I'm going, God is going to provide bread from heaven. Now get this. They wake up in the morning. They look out and there's a frost, a dew on the ground. And when the dew is lifted, there's this white stuff and they looked at it. They didn't know what it was. They were confused about it. And when they saw it, they said the Hebrew word manna. The word manna in the Hebrew means what is it? So let's get this straight. What do we know? We know that the children of Israel were told God is going to provide bread from heaven. And he provided it. And when they saw it, they didn't recognize it to be bread. The Bible says in the end of 16 that it was actually a coriander seed wafer that tasted like honey. It was basically honey smacks. You remember that when you was a kid? Straight up. You should tear that stuff up, not drink the milk too, because it was all sugary. Pots of manna. And they looked at it and said, what is it? Now, how does that relate to Jesus? John chapter 6, the Bible says, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Philip in John chapter 14 looked at Jesus in the eye and said, Show us the Father. And Jesus was like, how, how can you ask me that? When you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And Jesus said, I am the bread. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. How does that, rep, how does that replicate Old Testament? We, the Israelites knew Jesus was coming. They knew God was sending a provision from heaven. But when they saw Jesus, they said, manna what is it it don't look like what we thought it was going to look like after all this is mary's son it's the carpenter's boy and john john chapter 6 says i am the bread of life whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall not thirst this Manna, this, the children of Israel at the time, and we ourselves become so focused on what we do not have that we look at God's provision and say, what is it? Manna. I can't tell you how many times in my life, God, I've, I've begged God, God, I need you to do this. I need you to operate in this area of my life. And all the while, me praying, thinking it's a need... And I forget that I prayed about it, which therefore clarifies it as a want. Because if I really needed it, I would have continued to pray for it. And it was a want. And then when God provided me what I really wanted, I forgot that I had begged Him to pray and prayed for it. And to find out when it came, I was like, manna, 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 what is it, what is it? And then I'm like, oh my goodness, what a God provision that has come from the heavenly father to my life to bless me and to give me what I thought I 
needed but was truly a want and when the Bible says when we are obedient to him he gives us the desires of our heart not that I was praying for a million dollars no that they, if it can't be contrary to the will of God so don't go out there thinking well preacher said if I pray for a brand new car he gonna give it to me more <laughs> nope that's not what the Bible says it's got to be wrapped up in the design of God's will for your life. So you can't pray selfishly. Remember? We're two or more gathered in my name. In my name, there I am in the midst. So we see that. So we, we got to make sure that our focus is proper. And that when we are looking at God's provision, when you look at Jesus, this is what the world does. The world looks at Jesus, God's bread from heaven, and they look at it. And they're scratching their head and saying, what is it? So when we carry the presence of God into work tomorrow, and we are walking in the fellowship of, of the presence of God and the Holy Spirit operating in our life, the more you are around the presence of God, the more the glory of God is going to be seen in your life. Proof. Moses goes to the top of the mountain. And he spends 40 days and 40 nights with God and his glory. And he comes down and what happened? His face was so lit up by being in the presence of God's glory. He had to put a cover over it, a veil over it. Because they looked at him and started freaking out. Kind of like what some people might be looking at you when you walk in with a flat tire. You got hospital bills bad up, but you're walking into work. Man, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. And people looking at you like you a crackhead. <laughs> I get that look a lot. <laughs> Me and Michael will be talking about Jesus, and boy, it gets, I mean, we'd be at the table at lunch, right? And we and we eating and we having a good time. We start talking about church and God's people and we we'll, like play a song. And all of a sudden, 10 of them, they take off running, man. Why? Why? Well, the Bible says that Satan has blinded the minds of them that are lost. And we'd be like, come back, come back. We ain't going to bite you, man. We just got Jesus' love in us. We got, we got, we got provision. We got, we got truth. We are tasting the bread. We've been eating of the bread. It ain't manna to us. It's Jesus. So we got to make sure our focus. 2 Timothy 1. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know in whom I have believed. Timothy said. And am persuaded. You can't talk me out of it. That he is able. To keep. To guard. To protect. That which I have committed unto him. Against that day. This manna was so powerful. In the Old Testament. That it not only sustained them physically. But the Bible said that their shoes did not wear out. That their clothes never got tore up. That it provided for them continually. That's what happens when we get the provision that God blesses you. You ever, God gives you something, He blesses you with something, and it might not be like the the, it might not look like it's going to do. It might, you, you might, it might not look like it's going to last. But it's, it, every time you crank that car up, it hums like a kitten. I mean, purrs. Just, and it gets you from point A to B for like 15 years. You don't even have to change the oil in it. Because it's anointed a God. And what God gives you in your life, the provision that He blesses you with, will never run dry. Amen. Then there was a third thing. Oh my goodness. And this will be the last thing and I'll be done because we've got to go. The Bible says there was a third item. And I got it. I brought it. It's the only illustration I could find. But I had a buddy of mine carve me a, a rod back 30 years ago when we was doing martial arts together. So what I did was I went out to, I don't even know what you call the bush. Uh, Martha is some blooming at the side of my house and it smells like honey. There's bees all over. Mm, it still smells so good. And I got electrical tape taped around it. 
just so I could use it for an illustration. Now, Aaron's rod, Numbers chapter 17. Look with me real quick at Numbers chapter 17 if you have your Bible. I want to show you. Here's what's happening in this story. Moses is in the wilderness and he is getting some mouth from a man named Korah. Korah was in charge of taking care of the ark. Korah was not satisfied in the position that God had entrusted him in. So he looks at Moses and says, Who do you think you are to be in charge? That's what the devil does. I've had people, when we planted this church 10, 11 years ago, I had a couple of morons that came in here and started accusing me of being an arrogant, selfish, prideful, embezzling preacher because one Sunday I came in here before everybody else and started praying over every chair that God would touch the heart of life of everybody coming in here. They wanted my ministry, which is not mine to give because it belongs to the Lord. And that's what the devil will do. He will attack you with his worst problem, pride. And he'll accuse you and say, you're prideful, you're arrogant, you're a false prophet. I can't tell you how many times I heard them morons call me that. Harass me, keep my vehicle, came to a place where I was eating with my family, almost lost it and beat the dog crap out of one of them. But had it not been for Jesus, he's good because it would have really been bad. Preacher kills man in a Mexican restaurant after preaching on Sunday. Yeah, that'd be a bad thing. So these people were, they were challenging the authority of Moses and Aaron. Notice what it says. Warm my glasses. Notice what it says. Then the Lord spake to Moses, speak to the sons of Israel, get from them a rod for each father's household. Twelve tribes, right? Twelve rods. Twelve pieces of wood. Twelve sticks. He says, I want you to take twelve rods from all their leaders according to their father's house and you will write the name of each one on the rod. I want you to write Aaron, verse 3, Aaron's name on the rod of Levi. For there is one rod for the head of each of their father's households. Twelve tribes, twelve rods. Then you shall then deposit them in the tent of meeting in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And he laid all 12 of them out in front of the presence of God. Okay? Now follow me because I'm going here to this, to this ending. He says, And it shall come at the rod of the man whom I choose will sprout a bud. And go down to, uh, go down to verse 8. And the Bible says, Now on the next day Moses went into the tent of the testimony, and behold, the rod of Aaron from the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms and bore ripe fruit. Almonds. I'm not a big almond fan unless you cover it in coconut and chocolate. <laughs> or bathe it in some wasabi. That's pretty good too. So, here we have God telling Moses, take 12 rods, place them in front of the Ark of the Covenant, and whose ever rod buds, incidentally, it turned out to be Aaron's, he's going to be the one that will be, the, the Levitical priesthood will be the leadership that comes out of that, that right there sign. And so they do that. They come out in the morning, the next day, and they find Aaron's rod with his name written on it. And a bud had began to form on this rod. Bud, blossom, fruit. A bud, a blossom, and fruit. Now, for, for illustration purposes, I took something that was living and attached it to something that's dead. This is alive. If you were to smell this, it is, smells good. It is. I mean, I, I got a whole bush of them. I'm just going to go over and stand out there next to them today and just smell them from, for, in honor of my mother. Just smell how pretty they are. Now, I took something alive and I connected it to a dead rod, dead wood. But that's not how God works. Now, follow me here. 
God takes something that was dead, this rod, and from this dead thing, he produced life. Now I want you to notice these three items that were in this tabernacle. This was the law. This was the pot of manna, picture of Christ being manna to the children of Israel, and Aaron's rod that budded. He took something that was dead and gave life to it. The bud, the blossom, and the fruit. We've got three sections in the tabernacle. The outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies. Three in one. The Trinity, a picture of God's lordship and unity. The bud, the blossom, God the Father, the bud. The blossoms, God the Son. And the fruit is God the Holy Spirit. Now how does that make any sense? Well, I'll explain it to you. The bud is the source. The blossom is the bud revealed. Christ Jesus is God revealed. The bud, God the Father, the blossom, God the Son, and the fruit is God the Holy Spirit. The only way you'll ever get fruit out of a blossom is if the blossom dies. God the Son, God revealed, the bud, the blossom, and now Jesus tells the disciples, it's better that I go away. For where I go, I will prepare a place for you. But while I'm gone, I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit to you. To be your comforter and your guide. But in order for that to take place, the blossom had to die. The bud, the blossom, and the fruit. The fruit can only be produced when the blossom dies. The Holy Spirit can only be operational in your life when there's a sacrificial death that has taken place. The, you couldn't not just take any blood into the Holy Holies. You couldn't just take any, any... It had to be blood that was soaked in the blood of the sacrificial lamb from the coals. The coals had to be drenched in the blood. And they put it and they poured the blood on the what? The mercy seat. Now, the Bible goes on to talk about the rest. And I'm going to be done for now because I think it, that's all that we can obtain for one sermon. But the Bible says in verse 22, I will meet with you where? There. I will meet with you there. Now, for in closing, there we know that there's three items that God put in the Ark of the Covenant and placed the mercy seat over top and closed it up forever so that He would not look upon these three items and remember our sin and kill us all. So in order to do that, He put the blood to cover it all. Now, I want you to visualize for just a moment. I'm going to keep this cracked. I want you to visualize for just a moment. The Bible says, Romans said, chapter 8, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Not in you, not in preacher, not in the best church in the world, whatever that means. It is in Christ Jesus. Your salvation is predicated not on where you go to church. It is not predicated on how many times you show up for church. It is solely on the sacrificial death of Christ. But that past in your life, that, that thing that you used to be wrapped up in, the, the thing you don't want to mention that the enemy keeps bringing up to you. What do you say by way of illustration this morning we take the things of our past all of our insecurities all of the things that that the ala project y'all been talking about all of those things that the devil's trying to beat you down with and let's put them in the mummy case let's put them in the coffin why because then by the grace of god he closes it up when i see the blood i will pass over you it's all under the blood. All of my wild past. Preacher had one. 
I was I, I did the things I should not do, and I don't glorify my sin. I say it with a boldness that I come to his throne, knowing that it is under the blood of Jesus. Put your past this morning in the mummy case and let's bury it under the blood of Jesus and let's have the victory that we have in Christ because of the blood that was shed. Amen. Heavenly Father, this morning, thank you for your word. Now, that was a lot. There's a lot to take in. That was a lot to absorb this morning. But Lord, we're thankful for your word this morning. We're thankful for the, the meat that we've been chewing on today. And Lord, we can do a thousand sermons and a thousand illustrations, but unless the Spirit of God moves on the people of God, it is for nothing. Lord, I cannot summons that. I cannot, I cannot manufacture that. I cannot bring in the Holy Spirit on some new program or an ox cart, if you will. Lord, I rest in your power. I rest in your strength. I depend on you, Lord. I cannot do this. These are not my people. These are your people. This is not my church. This is your church. And God, we have got to get a new kind of thinking in our mind. It is not about us. It is about you. This is one piece of furniture that you designed. Three items that you placed in it. This picture of judgment is now forever in eternity picture of mercy. Lord, I take all of my insecurities and you know all about them because I got a bunch. And Lord, I pray that your people will follow the same example that I try to set. I'm going to take all of my past. I'm going to take all of my insecurities. I'm going to give you all of my, all of my, my sin, my struggles. I want to give it all to you, Lord. I want to put it and bury it in this mummy case, this coffin. And I want to put the lid of mercy over it in the blood of Jesus. And I give it to you this morning. So from here on out, I don't have to walk in condemnation. From here on out, I don't have to walk in a, in a picture of what I used to be. My position is placed in a preservation of your son Jesus and the death of Christ on the cross. Not that he died and stayed dead, but that he rose again the third day. And the same resurrection power that was used to resurrect Jesus is the same power that lives in me today. God, I pray that you would touch your people, that they will understand that, that they will, that they will trust in that. It takes a faith to do what we cannot see. To trust in what we cannot put our fingers on. But this, this tabernacle is tangibles. That you have used to become teachables for who you are. Thank you. You're wonderful. I pray that you would touch your people. Move in their hearts today. We lift you up, Father, for you are wonderful. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, let's stand to our feet. As he sings this song, I want you to stand there with your eyes closed and I want you to talk to the Lord this morning. And I want you to visualize placing your past in this mummy case. I want you to put your worries in this mummy case. I want you to put your insecurities in this mummy case. I want you to allow the blood of Christ to do what the element is supposed to do. And that's simply to cover. Let's sing. You pray. Mike is going to sing. 
just as I am. Let's, let's worship. placed it in the mummy case and now we close the lid it's sealed by him through the Holy Spirit in your life and it is covered by the blood this is the blood this is the place that appeased our holy God Heavenly Father this morning we thank you for making your presence on earth a place of death. Because according to all that we've been studying in Hebrews, something has to die in order for the covenant to be attested. Something has to die in order for life to be given. And God, we're thankful that you finished it all. You did it all. On the cross of Calvary. And Father I pray you'd have your hand upon your people. This morning. As we go about our 
week this week that we will operate in victory that we will operate in the newness of life that comes by way of the cross I pray that you would touch you would work you would strengthen for this we thank you and we praise you in the name above every name in the name above the names that don't want to be mentioned they don't even want to mention your name but it's in the name of Jesus the name of Jesus it's about Jesus it's about Jesus God let us place our life in the centerpiece of your presence let us put you in the centerpiece of our life let us carry you in to our work this week let us carry the presence of God in to our school this week as a teacher as a student let us carry you in to work let us, let us allow the Spirit of God to, to exemplify the fruits of the Spirit in our life because of not by the condition of what we are, but by in the position of what we rest in. Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.